بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good evening and welcome to the Ismaili Center Dubai My name is Suraya and it is my pleasure to be your Master of Ceremonies at this evening's event In collaboration with the Ministry of Tolerance we set out on an intellectual journey in exploring the themes of tolerance, pluralism, and compassion, perhaps at a time when the world could not need it more. As-Sada al-Kiram, nurahibu jami'an bima'ali al-Sheikh Muhammad Nahyan Mubarak Ali Nahyan wal-Hudur al-Kareem fi haflina lihad al-Yawm. We are honored to be joined this evening by His Excellency, Sheikh Mohammed Nahyan Mubarak Al Nahyan, and Dr. Karen Armstrong, who joins us to address the need for compassion in the world today. I'd like to begin this evening's program by taking the opportunity to welcome all of our guests present here, as well as viewers watching internationally. I'd also like to remind all of our guests that there will be a moderated discussion following Dr. Armstrong's address, at which point we hope that you will contribute to the discussion with your questions. May I now call upon the President of the Ismaili community, Mr. Amiruddin Thanawala, for his welcome address. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is with immense pleasure that on behalf of the Ismaili community in the United Arab Emirates and the Ministry of Tolerance, our partner at today's event, I welcome you this evening at the inaugural Ismaili Center International Lecture Series. As part of our knowledge initiative, the Ismaili Center International Lectures are held at the Ismaili Centers around the world where distinguished thought leaders of international prominence are invited to present lectures on subjects of major significance in the world today. The emphasis is to facilitate the exchange of ideas and to raise awareness of some of the most compelling issues of our time through dialogue and an exploration of the interconnectedness of faith and knowledge. We are privileged to have with us this evening the internationally renowned thinker and author, Dr. Karen Armstrong, who will deliver this evening's lecture. This is not Karen's first lecture at the Ismaili Center. In fact, she spoke in March 2012 at the Ismaili Center in Vancouver, Canada. His Highness Sheikh Nayan Mubarak Al Nayan, Cabinet Minister and the Minister of Tolerance for the UAE and also the Honorary Chairman of the Gulf and South Asia Patrons Circle of the Aga Khan Museum has sent his regrets that he's unable to attend. But we are happy and grateful that his son, His Excellency Sheikh Muhammad, Sheikh Muhammad Nahyan Mubarak Al Nahyan is joining us today for this evening's lecture. And he will be saying a few words on behalf of his father. Thank you, Excellency. Today's topic. Today's topic, compassion, is particularly relevant at a time when we are going through profound global change. The ethics of compassion, tolerance, and sharing are an intrinsic part of the Islamic values, which it shares with the universal values. Generosity with one's time, intellect, physical and material resources are enjoined upon us. We manifest this culture through a historic tradition of voluntary service. The United Arab Emirates represents a wonderful embodiment of the spirit of this ethics, with more than 200 nationalities living peacefully and successfully in the UAE. The country is an undisputed example of tolerance and inclusion and a beacon to the world of what the future might be. We are deeply honored that today's event is taking place in collaboration with the Ministry of Tolerance with whom we share a common mandate to accept diversity and promote pluralism, tolerance, and understanding as key core societal values. 
All these values resonate strongly with those of the Ismaili community and of His Highness the Aga Khan, who for the last several decades has relentlessly advanced these values, principally through institutions under the umbrella of the Aga Development Network, which employs about 80,000 individuals, is active in more than 30 countries, and whose principal aim is to improve the quality of life of those communities in which it works on a non-denominational basis. Acadian institutions are guided by the fundamental belief in and respect for human dignity, diversity, pluralism, and the importance of demonstrating compassion for humanity. Acadian institutions aim to create an enabling environment in order that the individuals and thereby the communities might become self-sufficient. Indeed, this ethics and the challenges have been described by His Highness the Aga Khan in the following terms in a speech delivered at the inaugural Global Pluralism Award Ceremony in November 2017, and I quote, some people make the mistake of thinking that pluralism requires them to dilute or de-emphasize their own distinctive identities. That is not true. What it requires is to ensure that one's individual identity is strong enough to engage confidently with those of the other identities as we all walk together along the road to a better world. As we walk together on that road, the example set by others can be a powerful source of inspiration." Unquote. Since 2008, the center has proudly hosted the numerous arts, cultural, educational, and social activities in collaboration with diplomatic missions, governmental organizations, and civil society organizations. Today's partnership with the Ministry of Tolerance is a great example of such collaboration, a partnership we hope to build on the future. On that note, I am pleased to invite His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed to deliver the address. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Uh, first of all, uh, my father sends his deepest regrets for not uh, being able to make it today for a commitment that has come up. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today, this evening, and uh, to deliver this speech on his behalf. Mr. Tanawala, members of the Ismaili committee, community, I am honored to be with you tonight and to have the privilege of saying a few words in the presence of Dr. Karen Armstrong. I can think of no other person than she who has done more to explain Islam to the world, especially to people of other religions. She published Islam, a Short History in the year 2000, at the beginning of a century soon to be scared by horrible events. Her book has enabled its readers to put those events in some sort of sane perspective. There are three of her extraordinary observations. All over the world, people in all the major faiths have reeled under the impact of Western modernity and have produced the embattled and frequently intolerant religiosity that we call fundamentalism. As they struggle to rectify what they see as the damaging effects of modern secular culture, fundamentalists fight back and, in the process, they depart from the core values of compassion, justice, and benevolence that characterize all the world faiths, including Islam. Religion 
like any other human activity, is often abused. But at its best, it helps human beings to cultivate a sense of a scared inviolability of each individual, and thus to mitigate the murderous violence to which our species is tragically prone. Dr. Armstrong's words resonate with us all, especially in this year of Zayed, the centennial of the birth of our country's founder, the late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan. Strong core values guided the life of Sheikh Zayed. He formed and led a new country in the Middle East in an entirely peaceful fashion. He spoke once of his approach to international relationships. These are his words. We have a duty as heads of states responsible for their people to deal with no one another with tolerance, compassion, and dialogue rather than with confrontations, wars, and destruction. Those attributes of tolerance, compassion, and dialogue also characterized in his governance of our new nation. He welcomed talented and ambitious people from all over the world to live and work in the United Arab Emirates. His welcoming Arab tent protected us all, irrespective of culture, nationality, religion, gender, ethnicity, or economic status. He valued people for their competence, their energy, their fortitude, their creativity, and their moral strength. His wise tolerance enabled the rapid development of the United Arab Emirates. Most of us in this auditorium tonight have together contributed to the prosperity and well-being that the marks the UAE and is doing so we have increased our understanding and respect for each other. We have become a peaceful, cooperative, and productive global society distinguished by astonishing diversity. His Highness the President, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan, treasures that diversity. And the President speaking for the nation's leadership has said, we recognize and appreciate cultural and human diversity, which we consider a key engine for sustainable development and a means for deepening the culture of openness, dialogue, and communication. The UAE now counts people from roughly 200 different nations in its population. Our founder, Sheikh Zayed, engaged the country's diverse inhabitants as individual human beings, worthy of being understood and respected. His tolerance opened the door for that personal engagement. His tolerance helped clear the pathway to a healthy pluralism. As we honor his example in this year of Zayed, we also recognize the continuing need to act in accordance with his example. To that end, we must capitalize on the instrumental power of tolerance, on the way it affords us the opportunity to talk with each other in rational conversations, conversations free of proselytizing, conversations that result not in apostasy, but in a deeper and more nuanced sense of one's own beliefs. Such conversations help us to appreciate the differences that animate our humanity and to identify values that we all share, despite those differences. Dr. Karen Armstrong has, in the last decade, focused our attention on the universally respected value of compassion and the ubiquity of the golden rule in the world's 
many religions. I commend the Ismaili community for bringing here to Dubai and the United Arab Emirates for the inaugural Ismaili Center International Lecture in this country. She has already taught us so, but I sense that her lecture tonight will affect us more profoundly than anything she has communicated in the past. I join you all here in welcoming her to the United Arab Emirates and thanking her for her unflinching dedication to clear thinking evidence. Thank you, Mrs. Dr. Armstrong, for being here. We eagerly await for your wisdom. Thank you. شكرا لمعاليكم على هذه الكلمات البليغة المليئة بالحكمة والإلهام. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your insightful and your inspiring words. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Armstrong, who, as you've just heard, has authored numerous books on religion, including A History of God, which became an international bestseller. Karen's work has been translated into 43 languages, and she has founded the Charter of Compassion, which is now a global movement. I cannot do justice to the list of Dr. Armstrong's numerous accomplishments, but I'll certainly try by listing some of them. She has addressed members of the US Congress on three occasions, and delivered lectures to policymakers at the US State Department. In 2006, she was invited by the late former UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan, to join the high-level group of the new UN Alliance of Civilizations. In 2008, she was awarded the Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Medal and the TED Prize in 2009. Between 2008 and 2016, Karen has been a trustee of the British Museum in 2013, she was awarded the inaugural British Academy Al Rodan Prize for Improving Intercultural Relations, and in 2017, was awarded the Princess of Asturias Award for Social Sciences. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Dr. Karen Armstrong. Thank you, what a warm welcome. Thank you, Sheikh Mohammed, for your very kind words. You've set me a challenge. I've got to be better than I've ever been before. Um, I just hope I can comply. Now, we've heard some words tonight, three words, compassion, pluralism, and tolerance. And I'd like to just begin by looking at the relationship of these three concepts, seek to see how they actually relate to one another. I'll start off with my word compassion, a word that's often misunderstood in popular parlance uh, and taken to mean pity uh, or, or even something rather soft and gentle, uh, kumbaya-like. Um, but the word with its Latin root compathein, uh, in Greek, compassio in Latin, means to feel with the other, to endure something with something, somebody else, to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And you must do it, uh, as I quote Confucius, not just when you feel like it, but all day and every day. Um, and this demands a considerable lack of ego, the great thing that impedes us all from wisdom and, 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 and the sacred. Uh, that we, uh, we have, in the words of the Charter for Compassion, constantly to dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there. 
uh, all day and every day. Um, the, you, you, to feel with the other means you put yourself in somebody else's shoes and it's been summed up in every single world religious tradition in what's often called the golden rule. Uh, first, Confucius, it was the first person to have it express this in a way that was written down uh, way back in the fifth century before the Common Era. Uh, and he put it, do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. Um, Hillel, Rabbi Hillel, uh, put it this way. He was once asked by a pagan to summarize the whole of Jewish teaching while he stood on one leg. If you can do that, the pagan says, I will convert to Judaism. Hillel stood on one leg and said, that which is hateful to you, do not to your fellow human beings. That is the Torah, and everything else is only commentary. Go and study it. Jesus um, had put up forward a positive version of the golden rule, always treat all others as you would like to be treated yourself. Um, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, of course, said not one of you can be a believer unless he desires for his neighbor what he desires for himself. Always putting yourself in one another's shoes and not letting ego and selfishness get in the way. Now, the transcendence of ego is essential to the to what we call tolerance. It's a difficult word, also with a Latin derivation, which I won't go into right now. But um, it requires us to transcend, to go beyond our personal uh, affirmations, likes and dislikes, things that matter very fundamentally to us, so that when they're endangered, we sometimes feel our very selves are imperiled and somehow impaired in some way. Uh, it requires uh, all day and every day uh, that you try and put yourself again in somebody else's shoes and do not cling to your own opinion. Uh, this can lead to the ego and it is ego that is, all, that is the, the, the chief factor that holds us back from enlightenment and our best selves. And finally pluralism, the same. Um, you see, we, we talk, when we're talking in religious terms, what we're confronted with is the ineffable, that which cannot be spoken. God, what we call God, goes beyond all thoughts and concepts. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says one of the uh, Israelite prophets, nor are my ways are your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts, my ways among your ways. And very often, our God, and it comes back to ego again, is a reflection of ourselves writ large, uh, very often endorsing all our own personal likes, opinions, and dislikes. And we must get, get beyond that, a constant recognition of the inadequacy of, of language and uh, words and, and con human ideas to express the condition of, of God. Uh, Ibn Arabi said, everybody praises what he knows. His God is his own creature, and in praising it, he praises himself. Consequently, he blames the beliefs of others, which he would not do if he were just, but his dislike is based on ignorance. Ignorance of the utter transcendence of the divine, which we experience within ourselves, but can never wholly encapsulate in a doctrine. As a child, um, in the Cat Roman Catholic Catechism, I had to learn this definition of God. Um, what is God? And quick as a flash, uh, we chanted, God is the supreme spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. Now I have to say at eight years old that left me rather cold, but I now believe that it's incorrect because it takes it for granted that it's possible simply to draw breath and define a word, again with a Latin derivation, which means to set limits upon a reality that must go beyond 
what we can think or conceive. So God goes beyond. Um, and we ourselves, in our constant daily uh, practice of compassion, dethroning ourselves from the center of our world and putting others there uh, all day and every day, uh, that uh, is, is, is the way we begin to apprehend the divine when we leave the clamorous self and the clamorous ego behind. Well, how did I get here? Um, I have to tell you that as a young woman, um, I did not associate religion with compassion. My youth was in a religious uh, order which was, had lost the, that value of, of, of compassion and respect. And I assumed that all, this was, this was what, what happened with all religion and wanted nothing to do with it ever again. I came back to it after a, a series of career disasters uh, everything I turned my hand to until I was the, about 50 came to naught. Uh, but, um, and my early books were very angry about religion. I didn't think that they were, you know, it was compassionate. I wasn't compassionate about religion either. Um, but, um, after a, a career disaster, my television career folded, and I was virtually penniless, I went off and I wrote the book that was mentioned, The History of, a History of God. And I had expected it to follow the skeptical line of its predecessors, uh, that I, people had taken an idea of God and just reformulated it, rejigged it as, as circumstances were convenient. But there was a difference, because uh, by this time all my television friends had uh, had faded away. I was living in a very remote part of London, living on baked beans and tomato sandwiches because I didn't have any money. And uh, I was in silence. There was no, I, I was in solitary all day long. Now, you cannot read, theology is poetry, poetry about the inexpressible. And you cannot expect to uh, read a poem successfully in a nightclub, a noisy nightclub. You need a certain uh, quietness uh, of mind and heart. And I found that in the silence, these texts uh, from Judaism, Christianity, and Islam were speaking to me in a different way. And that ch began to change my whole, my whole outlook. And um, I also found that that all my book, in all my books, much to my surprise, whether I was writing about God or a history of Jerusalem or a history of fundamentalism, uh, I was kept being brought back by the material I was struggling with to the issue of compassion, which seemed to be central. And I began, and yet I was perplexed to find that when, often when religious people got together, you never heard anything about it. People were too often, conde you know, a, a, a pope was too often condemning this or forbidding that, but not really talking about God or the in inexpressible or about compassion. Um, and that's why when I won the TED Prize, I, I wanted uh, to, to Ted to help me to create this charter of compassion that would, was written by about 20 leading thinkers and activists representing uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. And together, this short document was somewhat something that we all could agree on, and which despite the uh, differences between us, uh, which often we had to tolerate, uh, on this we were all in agreement and that we could work together for a better world. Now, the Charter has, a, you, check, you know, it's a complicated movement, and tomorrow I'm going to Karachi, um, and which is uh, doing wonderful work here, and I've been talking to the Karachi team, and I'd just like to give you a quick rundown as to what's happening and what is required in the whole issue of making compassion not just a nice idea or something that makes uh, you feel good, uh, but something that is actually working and that can change our world, that can 
uh, just as you're trying to do in your uh, new t work on toleration and pluralism, to get rid of some of this, this hatred and work together for a better world. But I get, I've got some notes here, so I need to put my glasses on, if you'll excuse me, just so that I can see them properly. Um, now, they've started com comple completely on education. Uh, they're focusing on education, health care, sports, women's empowerment, and the environment. Um, they, they have 630 employees now working with the Sindh government uh, in 135 uh, private schools bringing compassion into the curriculum and into the ethos of the school. And it's starting to, ha this is to train the leaders of tomorrow so that they will know what compassion is and how to behave with, with, with others. Um, and they, they've taken um, as their uh, training scheme some nine values that they've taken from my book, 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life, a practical way a uh, step by step, which you wouldn't know anything about here uh, in, um, in, in this Muslim, good Muslim country, because tw the 12 step program, some of you may have heard, is uh, uh, used by Alcoholics Anonymous to help people wean themselves away from, uh, from alcohol. Um, but we need to uh, wean ourselves away from our pet hatreds and pet dislikes uh, because we, we depend upon these. And we can't do it all. We have to work at it step by step. But here are the, are the values that they've picked out. Mindfulness, courage, forgiveness, gratitude, self-compassion, self humility, empathy, and altruism. Um, how to use them in, in social life, in the classroom, in, in mainstream subjects. And um, uh, the, 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 the staff have to undergo a training where they have to uh, look find out how they take these values into the, their own lives. Um, and parents are also brought in. So it's a collaborative thing that changes the whole ethos of the entire school. Perhaps most exciting for me was their, what their work in healthcare, the first thing of its kind. Uh, and it intrigued me because very early in the days of the charter, uh, a Pakistani young doctor from, was currently living in the Netherlands came to me and said he wanted to write a charter for medics because he said, look, we all go into medicine uh, because we're compassionate people. We want to help people. And yet the way we're trained and the kind of the hospital ethos and often the bullying that goes on hardens us so that we can't be compassionate anymore. Um, and uh, what the te Karachi team have been doing um, is to um, um, put, put all the medical personnel in the administration, in the, um, uh, the doctors, nurses, um, in the managerial side of things, through an intensive four-day program whereby they look into themselves and discover how they are standing vis-a-vis uh, -vis these uh, nine uh, uh, values from 12 steps to a compassionate life and they found it's been life changing for them and the effect on uh, doctors and the doctors are understanding the nurses more nurses are understanding the doctors more the patients are benefiting um, and that ethos of the hospital is changing so you see what can be done with some practical uh, hard work um, that uh, doesn't just keep on, I, there's quite a bit of hot air going on in the charter, you know, people wanting a sort of feel-good factor, and, uh, and I have very little time with that, but I try to be compassionate about it. Um, but, th but still, this is an exciting thing. I can't wait to get to Pakistan tomorrow. They're starting a new project while I'm there called Bridges. Uh, you know, in Karachi, there are a lot of street children living under the big bridges in the city. They, they've, they're creating under one of these bridges a new public space uh, in which uh, students from the universities will come voluntarily and teach the street children cricket 
and uh, as cricket and, and uh, reading, Urdu and English, mathematics, uh, in, their, in their free time. Um, and, and again, it'll be bridges, because not only is it under a bridge, but people, the, the, the rich and the poor in society, are bridging the terrible gap between them. And this is the sort of thing that I think that we, we, we need to do to change our world. I'm not a business person. I can have all these ideas and I sit at my desk and, or sit in my, my house reading these books and uh, thinking of theology as poetry, but I, I'm not good at organizing projects. Uh, there, for there you need people of business who are not afraid of failure, who are used to pragma pragmatism, seeing what will work, experimenting. If it doesn't work, okay, let's try again. Um, and so I think that as we move forward, let's not just make it all a head trip, but make it uh, a, a, a cooperative thing where we listen to business people. Interestingly, uh, it was after the, after the um, charter was published, it was not religious people who came forward to help me with it. It was business people uh, in, it, right in, in America um, and uh, in Europe. So um, off I go tomorrow to, um, to Pakistan. But um, to come back, all to my present work, I've just left and I'm a bit tired because I'm at the last final throes of putting my latest book together. Uh, heavy, heavy editing and I lie awake at night thinking over the words and worrying about them. Um, but it's all coming on and I've learned a lot. I always do. I start out with one idea for a book and then it inevitably it turns into something different. This is a book about scripture in all religious traditions, Chinese, Indian, as well as Jewish, Christian, and Islamic. And extraordinary connections between the two of them. I'm calling it the lost art of scripture because I see scripture, please don't take this amiss, as an art form. Um, it's always been a performative art. It is performed or sung, recited, as your Quran, reciting, Quran recitation is, of course, a great art to do it correctly. Um, and then before the modern period, before the invention of the printing book, everybody listened to their scriptures. Nobody could read, there weren't any books. It was sung. Um, and very often reading it today is rather like reading the libretto of an opera. A whole dimension of it is missing. And also people are reading it in a rather factual way very often, in a way that wasn't done before. But enough of that. What the scripture taught me about compassion that I didn't know? Well, it is the central theme of every single scripture. Every single scripture. And this business of equality is crucial. In India, the Upanishads say that, every, that within every single creature, every single human being uh, is, has a, its a core, a sacred core at its heart, the Atman, which is absolutely identical with the ultimate reality, which they call Brahman. So that the, when, hence, the, the, when they bow to that divinity, but it means equality. One of the early Upanishadic sages said, how absurd it is that we cling to our differences and think we're so special and interesting and unique. Uh, they said, we're, we're like uh, rivers that flow, all flow into the same sea. And once they have merged into the sea, they no longer say, I am this river, or I am that river. Uh, but we, they are just the divine. They are just the sacred. Uh, but they're uh, with, with others. And, and so, hence, the sense of equality, which is crucial to compassion. Compathy, to feel with the other, uh, and, and to, to feel that you are absolutely on the same level. Uh, very early, in the 11th century, before the Common Era, uh, the Chinese uh, developed a concept that, would, has, that has continues to the present day 
to uh, inform Chinese religious thinking. It's called the mandate of heaven. Heaven being the ultimate reality, which you couldn't call it God because it's also all things, all of us. And uh, the, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's nature as well, because nature is sacred, of course, and they have a very strong environmental um, feeling in Confucianism. Um, and that you must, um, you, you, that, that any, any ruler who does not, did not treat his subjects, the, the, the peasant subjects, with decency, heaven, the reality, would withdraw its mandate from that ruler and he could be deposed. And that is a, a, a very early but very extraordinary um, early thinking of, of trying to insert compassion into politics, which is essentially unjust. We've never created, for all our endeavor, a, a wholly compassionate and perfect state. There have always been people left out. And we're seeing worldwide, globally at the moment, the effects of people who have been left out. Uh, you and I, we live in very we're in fortunate, prosperous countries. Uh, but every day, really literally every day, uh, people are literally dying to try to get into Europe from Africa, uh, from North Africa, uh, uh, from the Middle East, uh, in flimsy boats, drowning. And the world does nothing. Um, and we are in equity. We, we, we display it aloud. We uh, put, flaunt it in our films, television, and uh, our cars, and our beautiful houses, and homes, and expensive clothes. Uh, and we, we try, don't try and think of these people who are left outside. Um, Jesus, the Quran, is simply a cry for compassion. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, received the uh, revelations in Mount Hira, but uh, and this is an important point, which brings me to the next, that he didn't stay uh, locked in prayer in Mount Hira, but went back down the mountain into Mecca and there engaged on a very, very difficult and challenging political struggle. And this is the second thing that I've learned uh, from my new book in the scripture, that script that religion, I don't know how it is with you here, but certainly in the West, it's becoming rather a sort of personal little quest of my own. And that may be because of secularization. I think that the separation of religion and politics is an extremely good thing uh, because it frees religion from the inevitable injustice of the state. But that doesn't mean we should all just sit and say our prayers while injustice is going on all around us. Uh, that should trouble us at a profound, profound level. Um, and the, the ancient, it, it, scripture was always seen as pushing people to action, practical action in the world. The in the Chinese tradition, the Confucian tradition, uh, you have to st you're, you're seeking enlightenment and you start with yourself. Uh, you start with getting uh, yourself right, uh, uh, learning about things, improving your mind, and pr trying to be compassionate. But then you move out. You don't, it doesn't stop there. You move out in a series of concentric circles. You push your concern out. First, to your own city. Or the or group around you. Next, you push it out to the next circle. You push it out to your country, and finally to the whole world. You must ne your compassion must never end. It must extend to the ends of the earth, not just within your own culture. Uh, the Buddha. We often see the Buddha, don't we, in sitting cross-legged in a trance. Uh, and he certainly did that, and he certainly achieved enlightenment by this. But he didn't stop there. Um, and um, he, after, it's a story, a myth uh, that tells an important truth, 
But after he'd achieved uh, enlightenment, uh, the inconvenient thought occurred to him that perhaps he should go around the world helping other people to deal with the suffering of life and enjoy his nice new peace. And then he thought, no, I don't want to do that. Um, it's going to be too tiring, too exhausting, too debilitating, and no one's going to want to do it anyway because they all want to hold on to their egos and they don't want to let them go. I'm, I'm not going to do it. At which point, the high god, Brahma, in the highest heaven, uttered a terrible cry. And he said, then the world will be utterly lost. And he descended from heaven and knelt before the Buddha, uh, the god knelt to the enlightened man, because in India, the, the gods are less than human, uh, are lower down in the scale of things than the human being. And um, he said, Lord, please preach your dharma, your teaching. Please preach it. Look at the world. And the scripture tells us that the, that the Buddha looked at the world with an eye of the, the, an eye of the Buddha and saw the suffering that was there, it was filled with compassion. And for the next 40 years, he's tramped around the villages and towns of India, trying to help others to deal with their pain. Furthermore, he sent his, made his monks do the same. They weren't to sit there meditating all day. He, he, he would say to them, go forth and travel around the world to end the pain and the suffering that you see all around you. Now, one of the, um, the, the, the uh, we know from the prophet's life how de terribly difficult it was. It wasn't easy. Uh, he, he endured assassination attempts, ostracism, wars, uh, immense divisions in the community, but he never gave up. And as a result, you have the success of the Ummah, an extraordinary success. Um, and that, but that is required of us all. And there has been a certain tendency, there's some, uh, there's some it may be particularly relevant in the West, uh, that people are just hugging their spirituality to themselves, but they don't want to do anything challenging. But the scriptures push us out to difficulty, to pain, uh, to deal with the suffering that we see all around us. And it's for that reason that uh, when I'm asked to say what a compassionate city would be like, one of our projects in the Charter is that mayors uh, endorse the Charter and try to import, impress it, uh, in, interpret it practically in uh, city, ordinary city life. And some, I was asked once, what should a compassionate city be like? And I said it should be an uncomfortable city. It shouldn't just be a place where everyone is going around saying peace be upon you and smiling seraphically, but uncomfortable. Uncomfortable because we should be uncomfortable and unable to sleep if we know that one person in the world is hungry. And we are surrounded by suffering on all sides. Uh, by pain and spectacles of pain that we don't want to look at. In Britain, it now seems de rigueur for, while well, you're watching the evening news, for the newscaster uh, to say, as he, before he introduces some new footage, you may find this disturbing. And that gives them, you the chance to switch channels or uh, turn, the, turn off or go out and, and get yourself a cup of tea so that God forbid that you should allow a pic terrible picture from, say, Syria to enter your hearts. We are surrounded by images of suffering, and they come to us nightly on their te our television screens more than any previous generation. But instead of blocking that off, we should see it as a spiritual opportunity because it creates that uh, sense of profound uh, dis, dis ease that makes us work for a better world. And that is what you're going to try to do here. It's what people are trying to do in Karachi, where I'm going tomorrow. 
Um, and um, I wish you all every success in your endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. You've given us so much to reflect on this evening. I'm certain that there are many questions within the audience and we'd like to continue this dialogue. May I now call upon Mr. Amin Hashwani for the remainder of our program this evening. Karen, that was a great presentation. Congratulations. I read one of your earlier books on the life of the Holy Prophet. And while I've, re I've read several books on that same subject, I found that the choice of your material, your anecdotes, the way they were presented, were fascinating. And I often wondered, how did you conduct your research to arrive at such unique material? Thank you. Um, I chose to write that first biography of the Prophet. I wrote another one later. They asked me if I'd abridge it. Um, and by that time I found out so much more that I, I started from scratch and did it over again. But I, the first one I decided to write after the um, Salman, during the Salman Rushdie crisis. Uh, when um, in Britain, you'll remember what happened. Um, and I was appalled by the, the, the fatwa against Rushdie, but I was also horrified by the way uh, the great of the good in Britain, philosophers, novelists, poets, were all rushing into print to say that Islam was an evil and bloodthirsty religion. And I thought to myself with dread that we'd learned nothing in Europe since the 1930s. Uh, the ho 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 Holocaust began with a media campaign, a smear campaign in the media. And we can't afford that ever again. Um, and so, and I, uh, it's uh, looking at the papers on one Sunday morning, I thought the trouble is that nobody in the UK knows anything about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, you know, they, 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 they don't have any biograph accessible biographies uh, that people could read. It never occurred to me that Muslims would want to read this. Um, I wrote it to sort of educate my own people. We found it very, very difficult to get a, 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 a publisher because they all thought I'd be joining Salman in hiding and would be uh, sort of immediately hounded down by the Muslim community. But in fact, when we did publish it, the exact opposite happened and more Muslims, I think, read it than anybody else. Uh, you said it was different um, and I, I, I learned much more about the Prophet since and that's why I wrote the second one. But I think why it resonated with a lot of Muslims uh, is that I was writing from a Western perspective. Um, not, not according to the Sira, uh, but I did use the Sira, but I had a Western perspective. And I was writing it for my own people, you know, my own ignorant people. But met, there are many Muslims too now who've been to a degree Westernized. Um, and they have questions that would, wouldn't necessarily be answered by the classical texts. So if it is different, I think that, that was why it was. Um, I, wanted, I was trying to explain it and learning at the same time. Um, but, uh, and to try to make him accessible to modern Western people who have an entirely different mindset. Uh, on, on, especially in the, in the UK. So, question. Yes, thank you very much. I'm glad you've had this uh, Irish Catholic catechism uh, <laughs> upbringing, so <laughs> we know where you're coming from. But I'd be very interested in your opinion uh, that do you think it's possible to believe in a superior being, to believe in God, but not necessarily believe or expect that there is an afterlife for the rest, for all of us? I'm not very interested in belief. Um, I think it's been uh, touted around too much. And would, do I believe in a supreme being? No. Um, and I think because all what my theology has told me, what all the great theologians that have liberated me said that God is not a being. 
God, says St. Thomas Aquinas, is not a being. God is being itself. S-A-C-Y. God is all that is. Uh, we are beings. Each of us has a little bit of reality, but we only know the kind of being that we are or know. We, there's a time when not, we weren't here, and there'll be a time when we're not here again. And we sicken and die, and we're imperfect. All the beings we know are fallible beings. God is, what we call God, is of an entirely different nature. And that most of the great theologians, uh, Maimonides would say the same thing. Ibn Sina, the same. That we can't talk about God in this glib way. And that when we uh, speak about God in this way, it becomes incredible. And then we shrink God down to size. And we can make him into an idol, uh, which so many people do, simply make him a ridiculous pronoun. Uh, the, the, one, like one of us, writ large, often sharing our likes and dislikes. But that is not what God is. Um, and uh, th I, I write about, I'm writing about this more in, in this book that I've just written, uh, looking at it in the way that it is with scripture. Uh, uh, as for the afterlife, I'm very agnostic about it. I have no idea. Uh, but I have no idea, and I'm not very interested. I feel that what the gift I have is life now, and this is what I have to do as fully as possible uh, while I'm here. Um, and very often, I, I, my childhood was blighted by afterlife. I mean, my whole religious life as a child was about not going to hell and getting into heaven as ensuring my eternal survival in optimum conditions instead of losing the ego um, and racked with worry and anxiety and about my sins and all the rest of it, all about me um, which again is, is, is you, you, you lose yourself in an, an apprehension of, of the whole mystery that is God. And I think if we lose that sense of the divine mystery, the divine ineffability, which means that you cannot speak about God, though you do, because we have to, but there a, comes a point when words fail you and uh, you have to let it go. There's a, a, there's a Greek theologian of the fifth century who called himself Dennis, the, uh, and he um, he was very widely read until the, uh, until the modern period in Europe, too. And he said that uh, and he would, during uh, his, the, Greek, the glories of Greek Orthodox liturgy, which is uh, ma magnificent, uh, fills you with a sense of the real numinous power, the, vo the, 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 the music and the intensity of it. Uh, far more so than uh, m modern Christian devotion, I find. And uh, the, uh, he would say, we say God, scripture tells us that God is this, that, and the other, and we say, but say this to ourselves because this is what we are. We're human beings that speak. But then there must come a moment when you say, oh, no, but then we're talking about something other something that transcendent, which means it is transcendent. We cannot get our minds around it, let alone our words around it, and fall into a reverent silence. In India, I'll just finish with this, they had a lovely, um, a, a very ancient uh, ritual they called the Brahmoja competition. And because they loved contests and competitions in India. And they would, uh, uh, they would ask, uh, one priest would start off and ask an impossible question about God. And someone else would have to reply with another impossible question or another impossible remark. Um, and you went on and on trying to answer one another. But the person who won, the winner, was the one who reduced everyone to silence. Because you've gone to the end of what you could say. And in that silence, the Brahman was present. God was not present in the wordy definitions, but in the 
shocked and reverent appreciation of the limitations of speech. So we have three questions and then, then after that we'll conclude. Yes, sir. Dr. Armstrong, thank you very much for your profound thoughts on co compassion and to His Excellency. Uh, one is convinced with the strong synergy between compassion and tolerance. My question to you, Dr. Armstrong, is in these days of political pol uh, polarization and divisiveness that we see in some of our Western countries, how do you convey this mantra of compassionate tolerance to the leadership and young people that social and economic policies to be implemented really improve the lives of people? How do you convey that mantra? I didn't hear all of that. Uh, how do you convey to the youngster yes. the concept of compassion, et cetera, and that you um, I, this, is, this is a big challenge, and I don't think I can do it uh, because I'm old now. Um, and um, I've been brought up with an entirely different kind of language and style. The internet, I do it, of course, but it doesn't come second nature to me. But the language is changing uh, with the internet, with uh, Twitter, etc. Uh, the language is changing. This is one of the problems we have with the Charter, I think. It's our, our language, and uh, the young don't necessarily get it. But I don't think we can talk about God on Twitter either, um, because we should Twitter ourselves into silence, a reverent silence. Uh, but we've got, and it gives you what people the impression that you can make a, a meet, totally meaningful sentence in 140 characters, uh, or, or make a really meaningful thing. I don't think you can. Uh, but I, is, I'm at a disadvantage here because I don't have any children. I don't have any nieces and nephews to put me right and say, you know, you poor old thing and, and, and educate me. And that's why I'm saying to the, uh, to the charter people, you younger people must take this forward now and somehow find a way to speak of these things. In, uh, I think this is, I think what they'll find, we've increasingly, as I'm trying to show in my new book, found the whole idea of the transcendence of God more and more difficult in the modern period because we rely so much, so heavily on the left hemisphere of the brain, which is all about uh, definitions and rationality and logic. And this has produced wonderful science and it's improved medicine and it's done wonderful things for human beings. But we've lost the intuitions of the right hemisphere, which is the home of poetry and music and art and, and the ineffable. Um, and so I think all our language about God is, is difficult now because we've made, we're starting in the modern period, we started to make God too much of a, another being and bringing him down to size. And the young people, I think, will be taking that a step further unless uh, the language suddenly implodes in some way and, and, and we don't know what will happen with the, new, with the new form of language, which is changing even as we speak. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, I have a thank you for your uh, kind words and wisdom. I'm not too uh, familiar with your uh, uh, thoughts, uh, so it's new to me. So I have a very personal question. You say you had a period in your life where you have no resources, no money, and now you have come to a point where you're older, but you have uh, resources and you have, you have a voice, a global voice. Ha what act have you done personally that's very compassionate? back then and that what you, that, that you would like to do going forward that's going to leave a legacy for you I couldn't hear that uh, going forward what would be your legacy uh, uh, with, with the charter and oh, books, what I would really like to see um, what are the, say, I'd like to bring the world together more because we've got a sort of disease at the moment of nationalism. Uh, Brexit, for example, a complete disaster and a complete denial of the reality of our world, which is global. Whether we like it or not, we now belong in a world united by the, on the World Wide Web as never before. Uh, we share the same, where our economies are inextricably combined. Um, and what happens uh, an atrocity that happens in 
uh, one part of the world can have repercussions uh, you know, in London tomorrow. Our world, we can't disappear from the world, and that's what Brexit is. And there's, uh, in the West particularly, there's this uh, now hatred of foreigners, and, um, and, and I, after the Brexit vote, I, I was a trustee of the British Museum, and in the week after the Brexit vote, visitors were coming to the museum and yelling abuse at members of staff who clearly weren't Caucasian, saying, you've got to go home now. Now, this has got to be stopped. We can't live like this. And what I would like to see is the, the world coming together. I mean, I think we've been maybe doing something like that now with this, this evening uh, with UAE and Pakistan joining forces to work on, on, on tolerance, compassion, and et cetera. But I'd like to do more of it. My dream, she says, Martin Luther King-like, has always been, I want, with the compassionate cities, I want to link some of them up to get around this so that our um, a city in the United States could team up with a city in the UAE or Pakistan. Um, their, their chil their, their, the, the children in the schools can have email friendships with one another. They can exchange news. And gradually, some of the misapprehensions we have about one another can be set aside. And we could set up a whole different network, a compassionate network, where the mayors of compassionate cities met together in uh, against all this ridiculous politics that is going on at the moment, to bring another voice into it, to bring the world together is what I like. Singularly unsuccessful so far, but tonight perhaps with a little, uh, a little uh, movement we had with, with the meeting that maybe that, that will continue and, and bring us better things. As people, a lot of people, especially in the United States, I find, simply want to, their own little city to be compassionate, and they're not interested enough in the rest of the world. We all have to care about the rest of the world, because we, sh we can't live without one another. And what goes on in, oh, in the Middle East today has repercussions in London. We, we are intertwined, and we're, at the moment we're in denial about this. Uh, can we take... Uh both of these questions together, because there's, the, there's this little young girl at the back. I don't want to break her heart. Uh, so we'll take that as the last question. Please, ma'am. OK, uh, so I'll make it very quick, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, you raised some very intriguing points about bringing compassion back into medicine. And as a physician, I think I'm really concerned about what was once the art of healing has become nothing but targets of uh, meeting commercial targets and money and it's all about equipment and medicines and pharmaceutical industry. So I'm very interested in your thoughts on how to bring compassion back into medicine um, because we've really lost our way somewhere. I think you're right. I think you're right about this, but I'm not the right person to ask about it. Um, I think this will be, uh, this, is, this, is, this is what you're doing and what you're discovering. But I think the, what your are finding should be made more available to the rest of the world, like that gen Pakistani gentleman from Holland, for example, who just wanted something like this. And I think, I think perhaps you could get your hospital to link up with other hospitals around the world and say, look what we've discovered and, and, and take it on. But I agree with you. This is another of these, uh, of these soullessnesses that is going on. Uh, I think, Karen, your talk really inspired because the gentleman uh, forgo his turn and he's given it to that little girl over there. Very compassionate act. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Yeah, thank you for showing that compassion and thank you for your time this evening, Dr. Armstrong. I wanted to hear more about if you feel uh, being compassionate can ever hold one back and if not, how would you recommend or advise someone who is truly compassionate, empathetic in a world that is still trying to get there? If, if, so for compassionate people, can they ever be held back in any situations because of their compassion? You mean, I see, yeah, okay. Look, what you've got to ask yourself in the long run is what kind of human being do I want to be? Uh, somebody who is successful, because uh, you're young at the moment, and things will change. You'll get old. 
uh, you'll be less able to do things. You'll become tireder and sadder, and sadder things come in as well as happy. But uh, do you want just to get to the top? Or do you want a humane life? And that's what some, each person has to do for themselves. If you are simply so bent on trampling on others in order to get to the top, I think you'll find life barren at the top there. Um, I can't say that because I didn't have any. Um, I just had total failure one after the other until I was 50 um, and had completely given up um, until my life sort of miraculously changed. But I, did, I wasn't trying for this. And, sometime, and so that's, that's a lesson in itself, you see. I never intended to be a writer. Um, I wanted to be a university professor teaching English literature. Um, and all these accidents, kept, uh, failures, and some very unjust failures, um, uh, pushed me into something that's much more exciting, I think, for me, and I've had a much fuller life. So don't try and plan your, I just say to that, try and remember if when you're struggling and thinking about your career, that the, and I often say when I'm given an honorary degree, and I, I get some honorary degrees sometimes, and I always say, look, I'm awfully glad to get this PhD because I failed the real one uh, with horrible publicity at Oxford. Um, it was a scandal at the time. And everyone looks astounded that I should admit to that. But I say, no, look, these young people are going to have some knocks. And it wasn't the end of my world. It was horrible at the time. But I'm awfully glad I did fail it now. I mean, I could have been uh, teaching 19th century literature. And I'd now be living uh, in a, as a retired lady with a cat or somewhere in the country. Um, and here I am with you tonight. Uh, something I'd never have planned. So, uh, in your search for uh, success, uh, let compassion in, but also uh, leave room for the unexpected. Thank you, Karen, for a wonderful presentation. I think by this response, Karen did rise up to the challenge that, were, that was given to her. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Karen. May I now call upon Vice President to uh, close the evening. Karen. Your talk has been a paradigm shift for many of us, including me. Uh, I think the shift has been from me and I to them and they. And I hope this is everybody conquers uh, with, with, with my thoughts here in this room today. The fact that you all are present here today is, is a submission of the fact that you you do subscribe to the notion of compassion. But today, I think, Karen, you have moved us from subscribers to enablers. I think the shift from a spiritual opportunity, we see this now as a spiritual obligation. And we, I, I am sure all of us here will now do our best to create that enabling environment that promotes the notion of compassion. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the Ministry of Tolerance for the partnership in hosting today's event. Uh, thank you to the, all the volunteers of the Ismaili community who've made this event happen today, to the management of the Ismaili Center, and to all the numerous individuals who worked very hard to make this event happen, and thank you for your presence tonight. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we've all worked up an appetite with all of this reflection and introspection. Um, so before I conclude this evening's event, I would like to um, advise that there will be tours happening within the center and we hope that you will take the opportunity to take those tours. The tours will start promptly at 9 p.m. and you'll find tour guides in the foyer of the building. Uh, also, please feel free to continue the dialogue over dinner. I think um, there's the, the maximum impact comes when we can actually take this reflection and really involve ourselves in conversation and really have that interchange among those who share various thoughts. And we've all been, been sort of uh, invited to introspect quite a bit this evening, I'm sure. Um, so on that note, I'd like to th take the opportunity to thank you for attending this evening's event. Dinner will be served just outside this hall. Have a great evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.